Welcome to the Backstage Stories of Women on Stage, a podcast by Women on Stage recorded live. Let's go backstage and amplify the voices of leading women in tech from all across the globe. Get inspired and learn something new. Because if you can see it, you can be it. Join us. Visit womenonstage.net. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Backstage Stories of Women on Stage, a podcast recorded live by Women on Stage, where we amplify the voices of leading women in tech from all across the world. My name is Moran Weber. I'm the CEO and founder of Women on Stage, and today we're hosting Hedva Kleinhandler, who's the CEO of, uh, and founder of Rooms and Words, a full-stack marketing and strategy agency. And today we're going to talk about how to discover your unique value and position yourself as an expert. Hi, Hedva. How are you? Hi, Moran. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. I'm so glad it's finally happening. We've been talking about it for... few months now and yeah. finally we're here seems like ages but here it's happening yay so welcome and I'm really really happy to have you here with us so um, before we start could you share a little bit just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself what do you do how did you get here um, a little bit that's the challenging part so <laughs> I'm Hedva. I grew up between um, New York and Israel, um, kind of having family in, on both sides of the pond. Uh, and growing up in the Haredi ultra-Orthodox community, I had a bit less access to higher education and just to people with interesting careers in general, and especially in tech. So it was less of a traditional path to where I am now. Uh, but it did make it an interesting path, I think, or at least a not boring one, um, you know, to live through. Um, and that means I had like a very kind of weird way, uh, getting here. So I started as a translator and an editor in the publishing industry, uh, with TV subtitles and books. I went on to be a blogger and like the guy. gilded era of blogging in the beginning and mid 2000s uh, and that led me to working with uh, lifestyle brands on cultivating their brands and positioning online in the very beginning way uh, days of Facebook and social media and later on Instagram and Pinterest um, mostly working with a very very small and low budget brands in Israel and helping them get their voice out to audiences in the US and the UK but also somehow getting to work with really great brands like Etsy and house back in the day um, and then my passion led me through like made no sense was not in my bucket list or in my plan but I was just very very passionate about women in the workplace uh, like you you Uh, Moran uh, and that led me to doing a survey for women um, in the workplace in 2015 uh, which became viral very quickly um, and later turned into my startup emerge which provided um, internal mentoring and uh, peer-to-peer learning tools inside organizations like meta before it was meta Siemens and growing startups and um, And I'm kind of I feel like I'm doing like the fast forward uh, version, but Covid came. We had to close the startup. And then I tr- I decided to marry my passion for marketing and positioning and branding uh, from before uh, and my passion and newfound knowledge of tech and started Rooms and Words, which is a global marketing and strategy agency with an ama- with an amazing team from all over the world, uh, helping tech companies from, seed stage startups to VCs and corporates uh, get their voice out and uh, help them with their marketing and strategy efforts I, I think that like the the thing is that how you help brands get their voice out and what we do a women on stage that we help women get their voice out like it It totally fits and I think it's uh, it's really interesting because since the first time I uh, I spoke to you I felt like 
we had this click about yeah. getting our voice out. So could you share a little bit how, how is it, um, how is it similar and how is it different to get people voice out and brands voice out? I think that's such a, an important and strong point, Milan, um, because I am passionate about both of those things. And also as a woman in tech and in the workplace, I've, I've, I feel, and I've felt those things, right? We, we've all been there. And I think the key thing is, um, there's a lot in common. Okay. There's a lot in common between getting your voice out as a person and as a woman and getting your brand's voice out. Uh, the thing is, it's much easier to do as a brand, not because it's easier technically, but just because there's less, there are less emotions involved and you have less imposter syndrome as a brand. <laughs> and it feels like more okay and expected and like a job to do when you do it as a brand. So you just bring less of your complexes <laughs> into it, <laughs> right? Uh, so it's just easier emotionally and mentally to do it. The funny thing is, as a brand, no matter if you're a B2C, you know, direct-to-consumer brand, or even an enterprise brand, you want to sound more like a person when you're doing your marketing, right? Or your public speaking. So you want anything. to get the, the complexity into your voice. <laughs> exactly. And you the emotions because, into your voice. Because at the end of the day, even if it's like the most boring corporate industrial product, you're selling it to people and you want to connect. And the only way to connect is when you hit on those chords of the emotions or the, you know, the need that they're facing or like finding this empathy or like speaking as a human being. So a lot of our work at the agency with brands is making them feel and sound more like just human beings, right? And like bringing the humans behind them to the forefront, finding the human on the other side, etc. cetera. Uh, but just when we do it for ourselves, even, you know, I've been in marketing and content and, you know, in different iterations for years, for like, at least 15 years, I've stopped, stopped counting at this point. <laughs> and even for me, it's like, it's easier for me to do it for a friend and tell her, Hey, like, I see like your value. And I like, of course you should write this. And of course you shouldn't think about it twice. And of course these are your unique, you know, value propositions. Uh, but when it comes to me, it's much harder and it becomes harder, the more vulnerable, you know, the position that you, you feel you are right. Like if you're at a really good place and you you've just like accomplished something, maybe it's easier, but if you're already be feeling vulnerable, uh, and maybe in, you know, today's market and you're looking for a job, for example, where a lot of, when, when a lot of other people are looking for a job, it can like add to like another layer of complexity. Uh, but actually it's, it's the same things. And actually as human beings, we have even an advantage because we don't need to, to make ourselves sound like humans. We, we already are there. We can use our humanity. And we need to, to mask that out um, yeah. in certain places. So can you share a little bit about your, um, can you share a little bit more about your startup? I mean, I think you had like a very, I, I said before, share um, um, just a few words but I want to hear more about it uh, because I think your path to entrepreneurship is not a very, um, is very unique and it's not something that you see every day. Um, and I guess it even says that there is room for anyone in tech. So can you share a little bit more about, about your, your incredible journey and your startup and, um, whatever you want to tell us. Sure. Thank you. So I'll, I'll start from the startup itself and then I'll go back to, to me and how I found myself in it. Um, working, uh, you know, with lifestyle brands and helping them market in Israel and in the U S and the UK, I got to know amazing people, mostly women. And a lot of them have been in corporate or in tech before they ventured out to starting their small lifestyle businesses. And more and more what I saw was that there was like common thread in their stories, in, in a lot of their stories, not everyone, but a lot of their stories where after having a baby or two, 
they found that the corporate culture or tech culture was not very um, inclusive uh, to women and to parents. Uh, and we're talking about almost 10 years ago. But uh, unfortunately, I think I think there has been a lot of change and advancement, but proud and progress, but maybe not enough. And that really connected to me because I came from a closer community um, where I didn't have a lot of opportunities. Women, uh, women, girls were not, uh, did not have access to SATs and to other um, uh, exams that could let them into higher education. I got married at 18 um, and it was expected that if I worked, I would work in something that has to do with the community and that it would be work. It wouldn't be a career. Um, and I knew that I wanted a career. I didn't know at the beginning what it would be. Um, and so I experimented. I told you a little bit about the different uh, things I experimented with. Uh, but I really found that one of the things that was most helpful was just finding uh, mentors or even micro mentors. And for me, it was in a very different way, because if you're if you go to university to, to college or if you work in a large organization or even like not a super large organization, but just, you know, with more than a few people, you can find people around you who have more experience than you do or have different experience than you do and you can pick their brain. But I didn't have what access. What do you mean by micro, sorry? What do you mean by micro mentors? So I'm getting to it. So I didn't have a lot ah, okay, of sorry. access uh, to that. Mm -hmm. So I found myself, you know, when I took my baby, who's now 17, to baby massage <laughs> classes <laughs> and stuff like that, uh, the other women were not from my community. So they were at the same place in their personal lives where they were like new parents. Uh, but they were years ahead of me in terms of career and networking and all of that. So some of them, I would just like pick their brain um, in a way that now I know to call micro mentoring, which is like asking them a question here and a question that they're maybe not what we look at today, like a uh, traditional mentoring process where you have your one set mentor and you meet, uh, you know, once a week or one, once a month. And it's very, you know, structured. It was more mm -hmm. like, Hey, I have a question. And I just realized you've been uh, a business owner for 10 years. And I just started out. Can I ask you what to do when a client doesn't pay, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and some of those women are still some of my best friends and maybe mentors. And maybe I've mentored them, you know, back during the years when I've learned and grown in different ways. Uh, so when I saw around me uh, women who felt like the workplace was not an inclusive and good place for them, and then they had to look for other um, solutions. And they felt like even when they were surrounded by other people's knowledge and experience in the workplace, they still didn't have access to it. It really made me very angry and confused. And that led me to doing this 30 question survey, which was like very long and very, very deep questions. And at that time, my business was doing very well. I was, I wanted to focus on that, but it kept bugging me. So I just did this survey because I said, I'll just get it out of my system. I'll send it to people, nobody will answer it, and then I can just go on with my life and business and forget about this, not even knowing what this was at that point. Uh, but I got this survey out, and within a week, more than 500 women from over 56 countries, I think, uh, answered all the 30 questions, and a lot of them, many of them didn't just you know, uh, pick the right answer for them, they sent me long answers and responses and messages and a lot of them asking okay so are you working on something to make it better and then i found myself in this place of hey i am a business owner i am an entrepreneur it was already i was in, on my second business right with my marketing agency for lifestyle uh brands but I never built um, a tech company or a product oriented company. Uh, and I didn't even know exactly what the product will be, but I did know that it would be some sort of a platform or an app that would help people get better access to mentoring and through that to being able to be included and to succeed and excel in their work, no matter their gender, their identity, you know, their uh, stage in life, et cetera. 
Um, so that was a huge, huge, huge learning curve. First of all, understanding how to build a team um, that could build a product, understanding what a product, what building a product is. Um, seeing myself as a tech founder, um, making other people see myself as a tech founder with all the attached biases of being a woman, being a mother, being ultra orthodox, which in Israel is a, a community that is very underrepresented in tech and in the workplace. And people have a, a lot of biases, like there are internal and external biases. And also overcoming my internal hurdles of raising money, even talking about money, right? Asking for money and not looking at it as asking for money, but as like giving, you know, the investors an opportunity to join me as as uh, partners, which is what it actually is. Um, and then of course, stuff that all founders go through, uh, fundraising, uh, selling to enterprise for the first time, team building, all of those things. So uh, it was a huge learning curve. It was definitely, um, I think more than just a, a business learning curve, it was it was a personal uh, learning curve because you, I feel like as a founder, uh, it makes you confront so many of your own demons and your own, uh, like I feel in, in my previous businesses, I managed to play to my strength all the time and avoid the places that I didn't like. Like, I don't like asking help from people. I don't like, uh, you know, I like cert like... I like a certain amount of uncertainty. I, that's why I've always been a founder and a business owner, but I also, I like to sell something that I'm already confident in. Mm -hmm. So I always sold services or like workshops or stuff that already I could make perfect before. As a tech founder, you can't, you can't wait for perfection. It just, it doesn't happen. Uh, if you would, then, you know, your competitors will just get there first. So it was, it was a very, it was a very, you know, uh, it was like five years of constant lessons, uh, not all of them fun, but it was definitely exhilarating, exciting and thrilling all the time. Would you do it again? I would, but I not in the, not soon <laughs> and not in the same way. Um, I think, um, one of my strengths as a founder because I didn't know a lot of other founders when I started and because I was kind of new and different and an outsider was looking at things differently. However, um, because I was such an outsider, I kind of took it with out of grain of salt that there is a very specific way of doing things that you need to run yourself to the ground, that you need to, um, you know, do your MVP within a very short time, that these are like the steps that you need to take. And I didn't question them enough, which is unlike me because I'm a person who questions everything. Uh, and next time when I do it, but not soon, it will happen, but not soon, soon. Um, I will question more and I will do it on my own terms, um, even more so. Like one of the things that I'm really proud of is that I didn't let, like, it changed me a lot and it made me grow as a person and as a business person and as a manager and a lot of things, but it didn't, it didn't change my values. And next time I want it to change me, like I do want to leave room for it to like teach me things and to, you know, change in a positive way, but I want to be even more like within, you know, what I know is right. And um, if, if it doesn't work, it's okay. A lot of startups don't work and we can go to the next thing or we can build it in a different way. Um, but just like stay true to how I know um, I should do business. I think I think your your story is so inspiring, Kredva, and um, it's not the first time that I hear it. And it's it's inspiring, just as inspiring uh, for the second time. And I think that you've grown so much from it and i think it really proves that there's actually even if it's hard even if it's a very very tough business it shows that there might be room for for everybody and even if you're you you didn't have any traditional background in tech or in the or in the workplace uh, as a matter of fact <laughs> And, and and you did it anyway, and you got to the highest 
peaks of, of your careers and you will get to even higher <laughs> ones uh, uh, later on, I'm sure. So I think it really, it, it's really, really in- inspiring. So um, I think that if your story um, demonstrate, it, it demonstrates that there's room for everyone, so what would you tell someone, especially uh, a woman, maybe even who's already working in tech for many years and she has um, enough experience, but she feels like that she's not an expert on anything. Um, I, just a, as an FYI, there's only like, there's less than 4% of uh, CTOs and startup founders for, with, techni- uh, with a technological background who are women, less than 4%. That's, that's really sad. Yeah. So what would you tell them? What do you- yeah. Uh, so by the way, one of the things that I was proudest of uh, at Emerge, my startup, is that uh, my co-founder and CTO uh, is a woman, was a woman. Um, she's still a woman, but the, the startup <laughs> is closed. Uh, and uh, I think around 50% of our investors were also women, which was incredible oh. and very, very uncommon. Uh, I totally relate to your question. And I think uh, it goes back to how we picture ourselves, uh, as you said, Moran, uh, we a lot of times don't see ourselves as experts. And I've seen it a lot with women and, you know, we should put things on the table. Yes, there is also a pipeline issue of women getting into tech and all of that. But even with women in tech or not in tech, but or not in tech um, positions, but in the tech world, I've mm-hmm. seen it time and time again, where, where I will meet or have coffee with a super, super accomplished woman, any man in the same position with the same amount of experience and accomplishments would be bragging about themselves, would be, you know, happy to be on any public stage. And we do have a perception problem that's external, external, uh, other people's biases and how they see us. But we also have our own internal uh, biases about ourselves, which of course it all goes back to patriarchy and how we were raised and our culture. It's not, it's not our fault, right? And right. not putting the blame on mm-hmm. on women or on other underrepresented groups, but it is something that we have where we are more hesitant to see ourselves as experts, as CTO material, as founder material, even women who have been approached, right? Not women who like need to go and say like I'm now going to found something. Even women who have been approached to join as a co-founder or, you know, Borani, you would know more than me, this is your world, uh, to speak right on a public stage exactly. a lot of times would would get cold feet or say like, hey, I'm not the biggest expert on this. Maybe you should talk mm-hmm. to him or to her, you know, and even I have that, you know, when I'm approached sometimes. Um, because yeah, I'm not just... sure. I'm not sure I have anything to contribute. But then you realize, like, she's a genius at what she does. And yeah, and also I think we just shame. judge ourselves so much more harshly because even when you ask me on some things, I would say yes, definitely I have so much to say. On some things, I would say like, listen, I think it's already been said. Um, but a man in the same position, a lot of times, we have no problem saying something that's already been said. You know. Even like if he has his unique take or even if he doesn't, right? So I think a lot of times it's it goes back to, you know, your question about marketing a brand versus marketing ourselves as people. Mm-hmm. Think about what you would tell your best friend, right? It would be so much easier for you to tell them, of course, you should write that. Of course, you should join that panel. Of course, you should say yes to that offer to be the CTO. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're... It's, it's a bit sad, but we're really, um, we're not that sub- objective when we, when it comes to ourselves, but in a bad way. So, uh, we should definitely think about what we would say to a loved one. So how do you do that? So how do you position yourself as an expert? Okay. So sometimes you try to, to go into, uh, your, um, to, to, to put yourself in, uh, as your, as a friend and, and it will be much easier, but still it just, 
I'm, I think I'm just it's, it's, here it's by myself. Really good what do I do? I think it's very, you know, it, it depends on your industry uh, or your like, you know, vertical. And it depends on you and who you are, your personality, what you feel comfortable with. Uh, for myself, what is really helpful for me, uh, I always find it easier. And also I find that my strong suit is not when I say things in, as an expert. I can, like on some topics, I, I have a lot of expertise, but I find where I can add a lot of value is actually in asking questions and in um, bringing other people's voices. Uh, but when I ask questions, right, and when I write about someone else or when I add my opinion about what someone else has said, yes, I'm giving them the stage. Uh, and I'm amplifying their voice, but I'm also amplifying myself because I'm adding my unique point of view. I'm showing that I know what I'm talking about. And I'm showing that I have my expertise on the subject and even just the way that I'm talking about this or making what the other person said or what an article said or whatever it may be accessible um, to other people or to more people. I'll give you an example. This is something, by the way, that I understood in hindsight. So it's worth taking a while looking back at your career and your life and seeing what worked for you, uh, even if it's not in public speaking, but in other things that may be relevant and kind of connecting the dots in hindsight, like Steve Jobs uh, said. Um, so for me, um, when I'm looking back, I started my blogs around, you know, in the 2000s, right? And one of my blogs that really, really took off was an interior design blog. That's how I got to Etsy and to Cows and to all those lifestyle brands that needed and wanted my help, right? Um, but when I wrote about interior design, I wasn't trying to say I'm the world's, you know, best interior designer. No, I'm not. I'm not even an interior designer. Uh, I love interior design, but I'm not. I'm not an expert in actually designing anything. What I what I was looking at was saying like, hey, let's look at this room or this trend or this design, and ask some questions about it and see what makes it work. Or let's interview this world-renowned architect or designer and ask them what have they felt and what brought them here and what lies at the foundation of this amazing thing that they created. And what happened was that I became a de facto expert where br global brands and magazines came to ask me to collaborate and participate with them because they liked my voice and they liked how I thought about things. Okay, the same thing happened with Emerge. Uh, I think part of my voice being amplified was definitely kind of the novelty of me being very, very different. I was probably the second uh, Haredi woman entrepreneur in Israel and there are not a lot in the world either, definitely not 10 years ago, um, nine years ago. But also, I wasn't trying to say, hey, I'm this huge HR or diversity expert because I'm not. I'm just someone who's frustrated with the what, what's happening in the workplace right now and the state of women and other underrepresented groups in, in the workplace. And I want to ask questions <laughs> and I want to connect people. So what I did was first, you know, literally ask questions. I sent that survey, right? The survey, women. yeah. And then I met, I just read whatever I could put my hands on, any articles, any books, any magazines in the world of future of work, HR, diversity, talent development. And I met anyone I could meet and talk to them and ask them questions. I didn't try to talk at them and share my big vision. I wanted to ask them, but my questions made sense. And the way that I asked my questions made them think, hey, she actually... She has a point of view. And another thing that I did was, this is actually nowadays a common trend, but I didn't know that it existed back then. Uh, I did something that's called building in public. Uh, are you familiar with that? No. I think you're doing that as well without knowing what it is. Uh, so it's, I, I think it's very cool. So building in public is the trend of founders going on Twitter, on Facebook and Instagram, 
and sharing their journey and saying like, hey, like this week we had a really, really hard week. Uh, we had to um, update our version and our servers collapsed or whatever. Or wow, this week I had a, an amazing week. I got to speak to this amazing expert, right? So I just mm -hmm. shared my journey and I didn't do it uh, in a totally kind of cognizant way. I did it because I process things by writing <laughs> them, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But what happened was that people... And then it's more authentic. Yeah. It's not it like was... you're, you're not building um, like... Exactly. I wasn't trying That's to you. grab. <laughs> exactly. So people really, uh, first of all, connected to just to the human being going through those things. Um, and especially since I think in my case, I think it's always a learning curve, but in my case, it was a very steep learning curve. So they were like, it was almost like a soap opera where they're like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is well, just a few weeks ago. She didn't know anything about tech. And then like two years later, she's like meeting with the uh, chairman of Snap, you know, <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. Um, so people became emotionally invested, I think, in this. And also mm -hmm. what happened was that people from the industry really could see my expertise because in the way that I was speaking about how impressed I was with a person that I learned from, for example, or talking about an article I read or talking, and then of course, talking about how I implemented the things that I learned into our product or just talking about my amazing team and how impressed I was with my CTO and co-founder and what she's gotten accomplished that week. They could see my expertise without me kind of, you know, uh, going and like shouting, Hey, look at me. Right. Because I was talking about other people or I was talking about building something. So a lot of people are not that comfortable about, with talking about themselves and it's completely fine, more than fine. And I think it's actually much more interesting to talk about other things, talk about your work, talk about the people you meet, talk about an article you read, your personality and your expertise will shine through. And this is, of course, not right for everybody. Like my uh, comfort zone is writing. So of course, this was easier. But if you're more comfortable being on video, that's amazing. You know, we're in the age of TikTok and Reels. Um, and think about like, try to to look at, like to look back at your dots from your career and connect them and see in hindsight, where are the things that kind of set you apart and that you're more comfortable with putting out there? Those are like your, your uh, wow factors. And it doesn't yeah. really have to be something um, from your career, it can be something completely different. And I, I really, I love that. I love the part where you say that even if you translate or amplify others, then your voice pops, pops out. That's a very yeah. interesting, uh, uh, perspective. And I, I must admit that I, I, um, I can relate to that personally, um, and I don't know if our uh, listeners or viewers um, know my story at this at that sense. Because um, other than being uh, the founder of, uh, of uh, Women on Stage and uh, and um, software developer, I'm also a social psychologist and. Most of my career, I, I studied com computer science and psychology, and most of, I, of my career, I used to hide the fact that I'm also a psychologist because uh, people thought I'm less technical and maybe I'm not as qualified. Um, maybe I don't get, um, maybe I'm not a, um, a very good coder if I'm a people person. Like you can't have both. So I used to hide that fact, um, but it was only um, five or six years ago when I started with uh, public speaking and that I realized that this isn't something I should be uh, embarrassed about. This is something that I should actually be proud of because it actually makes me a better coder because I can understand how people read code, how people interpret code. And then I created a talk about the combination between psychology and code. 
and it went like totally viral. I've given I've given that talk in in multiple tech stages uh, worldwide, and it really um, and it made me realize that that like vulnerability uh, per se or something that I used to be very shy about and I used to keep that to myself, that's actually my superpower. So I should totally. be proud of that. And, and it really, and I bring all of the, all of that knowledge into women on stage. And that's like what I do today. I use that, um, that hidden part of my personality that, wow factor that I didn't even see as a wow factor before. And I combine all of these things together. Okay. So, so only when I realized what that secret superpower was, I realized how to position it as a superpower and I'm using it every day. So I really, I, I really encourage you all to find those secret superpowers in your journeys and it can be anything i mean i i bet that you had that that you meet and you met a lot of women uh throughout the years that didn't even, even see those uh those superpowers in themselves totally. i can tell you a story from myself i started sewing um when my son was three so 14 years ago i was still in the publishing industry and i started one of my blogs that later became like the interior design blog. And I wrote a lot about sewing and a lot of people in the publishing industry looked at it as like, whoa, like, cause before that I had like a very popular uh, blog about books. Like, why are you like dealing with those shallow things like sewing, decorating? And I kind of refused to like agree with that. Um, and I had a lot of, I had a lot of, um, vulnerability about like doing a lot of different things like being in publishing and being you know in uh marketing for lifestyle and then being in tech and not coming from tech uh but when i looked back i saw that all of the things that i did whether they were in my career or just as a hobby they all really added to who I am also as a professional, as an expert. And I think uh, creativity, like you learn so many things from these things, whether it's your, if you're running marathons or you're playing, I know any kind of, uh, you know, ball or tennis or whatever, or you're sewing or you're knitting, you learn so many things about managing your time, boundaries, creativity, um, what annoys you what makes you tick sometimes you even learn things about things about management um and i think it's really someone like you Mulan, that has like this dual experience and background that is so often their superpower because that is the edge because nowadays so many people have great education and great experience and we we're always looking how to you know how to position yourself as like an expert that's like our topic today how to stand out so this added like point of view which can make someone double click or something or can add an emphasis to something that is so often the things that set you apart and once we just take like kind of a zoom out and look at it as if we would look at, at like a best friend and not with us, with all our complexities and, you know, imposter <laughs> syndrome and all of that, we can see it. We can see it for actually what it is. Uh, so I really stand by what you said. I love that. And it can be anything. It can be music or sports or cooking, you know, cooking. Anything. Definitely. So like it's the, it's the fusions that yeah. makes it special and makes it memorable and makes it interesting. And that's what makes you who you are. You. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. So, okay, Khedva, it was really such a fascinating episode. And I really, really enjoyed speaking with you and having you today with us. Thank you and so much for having me, Ron. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thanks for everyone who joined in. We'd love to, uh, to see you again. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks to everyone who joined in. We'd love to hear your feedback and your thoughts. 
Join us again at the Backstage Stories of Women on Stage. Visit womenonstage.net and follow us on social media.